Hello, Max. Hi, Antoine. Can you introduce yourself? First? Okay, I'm Max Schumann. I'm the director of Printed Matter. I'm also an artist, but I haven't been oh. making art for the last two or three years because there's too much work at Printed Matter to do. <laughs> but, um, but, um, I, and I haven't made books since the '90s, probably. Um, Young, books. but, but yeah, mm -hmm. but, um, but I've been at Printed Matter since 1989, and I've worked in all different aspects of the organization. Uh, but was basically manager or associate director for the last 20 years or so. Um, and, I mean, let, let's just go right to the zine thing. I mean, f to me, the, the term zine is becoming further and further removed from what my experience of zines were, which was basically mm -hmm. 80s punk rock mm -hmm. zines. And then zines were, they were... What, what now people call zines seems to more be like a, a meth, a meth, uh, an aesthetic, uh, uh, um, an aesthetic, a format, and then maybe also like a, a spirit or ethos or mm -hmm. something like that. And, and it is the aesthetic is, you know, uh, uh, cut and paste. The format is photocopy stapled for the most part. Some are digital printed and, and whatnot. And there are different types of bindings and stuff like that. And the, um, and the spirit ethos is DIY. Um, um, and, 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 and that is the qualifying thing of what people call the scenes. And it's basically what it looks like, you know, and what, and what it in generally conveys. But my experience of the zine in, in the 80s kind of punk and hardcore punk scenes was alternative media. That's mm -hmm. what it was. It was a functional, um, it was a functioning information um, vehicle for um, underrepresented and marginalized communities. Um, um, it's like when you're not represented or misrepresented in the mainstream media and your forms of art and culture and things like that are either being, you know, or are being, you know, in the case of punk, misrepresented in the media as you make your own media and that's what the zine was about. So it had more of a relationship to like, you know, video activism as opposed to video art. Um, and um, so, and it was very much part of a DIY politics of you make your own culture and then you represent it through making your own media. So you start your own band, you make your own record label, you do your own tour booking, um, you band your resources together with the other bands and communities, um, you build your own underground network, and then you make media to represent it. So the zines for the most part were, I mean on the one hand they were, you know, a lot of them like Maximum Rock and Roll, that's like a proto zine, and, it's, and it was, it's not an art, art artist book or an artwork, it's, you know, the bands that don't get covered in the, in the mainstream media, the record reviews, tour, you know, show reviews, um, and then also political, political and news essays and things like that. And then there are very many different, much more home, homespun, short, smaller edition versions of that. Everyone was doing zines. But it also was, there also were the zines that like just conveyed lifestyle, so not necessarily covering art and, art and culture, but like travelogues of, you know, people who, nomads and stuff like that, or diaries and things like that, or, or interesting odd topics, and a lot of it had to do with like, you know, with class, I think, you know, class experience and stuff like that. So there was this great zine called Dishwasher, which was people would submit their experiences of working in kitchens, and that's what people did back in those days when you were in punk rock bands and stuff like that. You paid your bills by, you know, working at, at Howard Johnson's washing dishes and, and or waiting tables or, or one of those things. And, um, and um, or there was a more established one. It, had, it was like offset printed, but it was Process World, and that was about uh, wage labor experience and how to, um, how to intervene or subvert the workplace through different things of like how to, how to not work while you're working and how to, you know, whatever, mm. disrupt the, the, the wage labor system and stuff. And there's a whole zine with contributions and, and testimonials and manifestos and other kinds of things. Um, so, and that 
you know, and that, I mean, the, there's, I mean, there's different trajectories. I'm not an academic or scholar of zines, but my understanding and experiences of them is, is that there's the trajectory of the fanzine, which is, you know, like rock in general, pop music was, was also not represented by the media in the early days. So the early um, fanzines for, you know, these new rock bands, um, that were emerging, and then like the 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 exhibit that Johan Kugelberg did the, of Lenny Kay's collection of sci-fi and fantasy zines of where and again it's a form of culture that's not represented by mainstream media, and so people created their own media around it. So the sci science fiction and fantasy fiction was you know you know low low culture, but it had a really broad and wide fan base, and so people would make their, you know, mm -hmm. make their media about that. And do you see any connection between this and, uh, and the artist book tradition? And the expanded like? version of zines, not... And, and what is happening today in, well, the, in the zines made by artists? And what is, what is, I mean, I'm fine with, the, with what a zine is changing definition. I just want to finish with a historical mm -hmm. thing, is that okay. the other trajectory that, that I think the... the the punk zines kind of came out of was also political pamphleteering. So mm -hmm. that, that goes all the way back to, you know, you know, 17th century, which had mm -hmm. to do with the, 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 the printing technologies becoming more accessible and where a merchant class could afford it instead mm -hmm. of it just being the, the court and the, and the church, um, who controlled the presses and then, and then, and, um, and, and uh, and 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 so it was self-published outside the mm -hmm. outside the mainstream, you know, the dominant you know uh, power center of culture, mm -hmm. um, and had a big part to uh, to do with you know the American Revolution and the French Revolution and things like that mm -hmm. of the ability to be able to publish alternative political mm -hmm. views, and then um, um, and so there's always been a tradition of underground um, political press. Um, that also informs what zines were mm -hmm. in the in the in the in the 80s, um, and and um, and whether it's you know the the left press of the of the you know going whatever of the <laughs> whenever the 19th century and the early 20th century up until the underground press of the 1960s that we just mm -hmm. did a show about where um, it was interesting. There's the East Village. Other, which was a little bit more professional, and you can kind of see that it it was the you know the the kind of um, the parent of what would come like your typical weekly liberal um, you know culture news tabloid newspaper that like any all cities in the U.S. have at least. Mm -hmm. um, but the Rat was, and this is explained to us by practitioners in those magazines, is there were people who wanted to publish these. You know, it was uh, civil rights, Vietnam War, and then alternative countercultural lifestyles and things like mm -hmm. that. Um, and um, and they were novices; they didn't know what they were doing, and so mm -hmm. they were going into like the graphics and the layout and stuff like that with no. They weren't trained, and they didn't go to art commercial art school and learn graphic design and stuff like that. They mm -hmm. they learned it as they did it uh, in making the things, which is what makes them so aesthetically rich and stuff. Is because mm -hmm. they were. Um, experimentations and things like that, but anyway. So, so what? So, what's your question about the, the, like the relationship? I mean, most of what you 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 published uh, artist books uh, as an artist, and you were also close to that punk rock uh, scenes, uh, scene of zines. And and do you see a connection between the two, or or is it something that happened much later, like uh, like now with that ethos ethos that you were. Uh, telling about and the um, tradition of artist books. I mean, the thing that's the this expanded notion of zine being, you know, um, uh, the way something looks and feels, as opposed to, I mean, the idea of art as information is something that the mm -hmm. conceptual artists were very interested. In, but if you look at a punk rock zine from the eighties and a conceptual artist book by Lawrence Wiener or, or Peter mm -hmm. Downsborough, um, they they look and work in very, 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 very different ways. Mm -hmm. 
but they both are informational vehicles. So that's what and that's they are the, both self-published outside of a system, uh, trying to create a new system of information. Yeah. Um, and most of the zines, or what we call zines now, we mm -hmm. would not have called zines back in the eighties. Mm -hmm. We would have called them artist books. Mm -hmm. Um, because they were not, because they, they didn't have that, um, that, you know, utility aspect, that utilitarian mm -hmm. aspect mm -hmm. that of being a news information vehicle. Now, mm -hmm. of course, certain aesthetics evolved from them. And when Rich Jacobs did the, um, skate zine, um, show at, at the old printed matter, um, it was just incredibly rich, the, the, the different styles and among them were like Mark Gonzalez and. What's his name? A few of those other guys who do Ed Templeton and stuff like that, of people who were connected to the skate scheme or very much part of it, mm -hmm. and then also had a, a zine making practice. And there's this very, you know, uh, rich, stylistic, you know, cut and paste aesthetic, mm -hmm. which, you know, derives from the, you know, from that cut and paste, you know, early punk aesthetic as well, you know. Um, um, wait, what was I? I forgot my line of thought. And then those people, they ended up making artist books or, or um, art zines some, somehow. Uh, the Ante Peltons and Mark Gonzalez, they, they started making zines that weren't informative and that were uh, because they didn't... Yeah, they were purely... Be informative because of the uh, internet mostly, I think. And, and, and then they could make zines that would be just uh, uh, writing... Type. Yeah, well, maybe maybe Pettibone was really the bridge because he was his zines were being distributed with SST Records mm -hmm. and releases, and um, and and they were not functioning as these news mm -hmm. vehicles. They were really purely artist books. You know, these these mm -hmm. the you know a book uh, uh, the the whole of the magazine being the being the artwork. So. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a, there aren't strict lines and divisions and stuff like that. There's a lot of overlap and stuff, mm -hmm. but again, it's like the, the, what the communities understood as a zine back mm -hmm. in the eighties was, was, you know, the stuff that people consider zines now would not be considered mm -hmm. zines. Mm -hmm. They'd be considered artist books, self-published artist books. And, and well, in this 80s zine, were, weren't there at some point um, um, a will to make it uh, less informative or, or just, uh, I don't know what I'm saying, um, like, like what Pettibon did um, and what these royal monsters did, for example, was to, if you take the information out, then there's only the art. And, right. And it's almost like... Um, um, Destroyer Monsters was an art band, and it was really they took the way of working of music and and transformed it into and used it into art and right. to produce uh, new forms of uh, artworks. Yeah, where the art and the performance and the and the music and the and the and the zines all are part of the art making activity. Mm -hmm. Um, at the, on the at the keynote address that Martha Wilson gave at the uh, Contemporary Art Book Fair, she it's a really interesting thing she said was how she was kind of dismayed when like that at first and the around the time Franklin Furness and Printed Matter were founded in seventy six, there wasn't really a, an established terminology. Artist book mm -hmm. didn't really exist as a as a recognized term. There had been like a few exhibitions exploring you know artist books, what we now call artist books, but um, and it was kind of later, and I think it might well be the librarians um, who needed to find a definition for this activity. But Martha said at the time, is that um, is that you know they were doing performance, they were doing video, people were doing conceptual art projects, you know, um, um, different processes and other kinds of you know immaterial art activity, mm -hmm. and. Um, and that they were all part of the same thing, and mm -hmm. that, and that, um, and I think that's something that we should probably come back to or, or revive to inform our mm -hmm. sensibility. Like it, it is like we're because we deal with distribution of artist books, mm -hmm. we have to deal with what the hell is, <laughs> what the hell is an artist book, and um, 
but it's it really can be many many different things mm -hmm. and I think it's important to Do you think to have a, a broader definition between I mean we have a pretty broad <laughs> definition uh, mm -hmm. as it is so <clears throat> but um but yeah I, I mean I guess that's all I have to say about the the problem of of defining like mm -hmm. like what is a zine what is mm -hmm. an artist book um is that The, oh, the, the there was a there was a group at the um, at the fair a new addition to friendly fire which is a collective from Baltimore and they kind of have a manifesto about publishing and publishing being you know the exchange of ideas and communication and that it doesn't have to be it can be media work but but it can also be um, it can also be dialogue and community and information exchange um, outside of media in 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 human interaction mm -hmm. and dialogue and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. that's a pretty expanded notion of what publishing is that I thought was interesting. Yeah, that's good. Can you tell us a bit about uh, Friendly Fire, that section that you curate at the fair and who we can find there and why you chose them? Um, well, it's Friendly Fire... At the first fair, when I curated Friendly Fire, was to make a, at the first New York Art Book Fair, it was to, it was to have kind of like a subsidized group of independent publishers, uh, collectives, but not necessarily also some individuals, not necessarily political activists and stuff like that, um, um, to offer free tables to a group of independent publishers who wouldn't be able to afford. And and so because they didn't get the, the uniform tablecloths and the signage and stuff like that, is I told the 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 people who I selected and invited to go crazy with their displays and make their own signs and make their own tablecloths and make and just consider their table really as an installation site and as an art project and 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 thing and. And they did that, and it was really lively. I think, who was there? I think um, uh, LTTR had a table that included zine-making workshops and things like that. Um, one of the early years, Dexter 70, Dexter Sinister had a uh, mimeograph machine and was um, doing publications and out, out um, based on information that was gathering at the fair. Um, but anyway, it was, and visually it was like very striking from the rest of the fair because all the rest of the fairs had like the nice little signs and the great tablecloths and the friendly fireplace was this really energetic, um, chaotic, um, um, creative, um, uh, whatever, um, uh, section of the fair. And, and I must say is that after three years or so, that's like those first three years, they're like that's where the zines were, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, was in the friendly before fire there was before, fire. before there was a zine tent or a okay. zine section in those first few years, and then when all of the independent publishers were just you know there's just been this surge of new publishing projects and stuff like that, and so it became necessary to have a zine table. Is that whole kind of concept of like uh, you know of 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 table as installation site mm -hmm. was kind of taken over by the 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 zine mm -hmm. the zine. Um, tent. And then also I really think spread throughout the entire fair. So you really see booths all throughout the fair that are, that are, that are really treating their, their, their tables as project um, sites or projects in and of themselves. And, um, and so at that point it was like the, like Friendly Fire was indistinguishable from the zine tent. So I decided to focus it m more on, on, um, on groups with kind of like a pol artist groups with a or with a with a with a political or activist um, practice um, and and a publishing practice and mm -hmm. so that's for the most part what it is and it's a lot of people come and return and stuff like that mm -hmm. but it's a like Red seventy six and temporary services from Chicago and Autonomy Media here in New York and. Um, And uh, Gorilla Girls are are are, uh, are multiple fair 
guests and stuff like that. But I'm interested. I need to uh, the the group from what do they call the group from Baltimore Press Press, I think, um, and then also from Baltimore uh, Lawrence. Who I don't remember his last name. Who does? Um, don't put, put take this part out because I really should know it. I have to look up his. Um, he does a magazine in in, in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, there were there were two new editions this year. Mm -hmm. um, um, but yeah, I want to I want to identify more kind of like um, and so artists, the, collectives, and groups who have a real activist as mm -hmm. well as publishing, whether it's community, political, or other kinds of forms of activism. Mm -hmm. um, and what yeah, the, like what is art art activism? Yeah, and that's what the most Artist interesting activists. thing is that in this section, then the, the zines are much more informative because they are political, because um, they have a, um, an activist uh, point of view. Yeah. And, and then they look a lot more like um, uh, usual zines, like the punk rock zines and this kind yeah. of thing. And all, isn't it because um, those people uh, try to blend uh, art and life in a, in a political way, in an almost a situationist way? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I think so. Um, but that's not to take that away from some of the zine publishers and stuff like that, because I think a lot of them um, it you know that's that is a lot of uh, of kind of like underground or independent publishing mm -hmm. activity. It is activist and it's in and of itself in that mm -hmm. in that it is kind of like a independent um, control of your own representation mm -hmm. instead of being represented by someone else as mm -hmm. you are representing yourself. And so, like that's a really important part of the queer zine legacy and stuff. Um, uh, trajectory as well, so um, so that is very political in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Like the act of publishing is activist, and that you are taking control of your representations. So, mm -hmm. uh, well, what aspect uh, haven't we talked about that you think is important to uh, in, in this kind of phenomenon, self-publishing? Um, the I think there's a like this like with the growth of the New York Art Book Fair and um, and this resurgence of artists and other creative forms of publishing and you know that that the is you know in the midst of the on of digital technological mm -hmm. advancement and our complete you know, um, immersion into digital communication and stuff, it's kind of, you would, like, the tech um, utopians that, you know, in this new digital age with free information, mm. it's going to be this kind of, like, di like digital utopia. You'll mm -hmm. have free information, mm. you'll have free markets, you'll have free mm. societies. Free markets don't equal free societies, so-called mm -hmm. free markets, which are absolutely not free at all actually are the opposite because for the last since the growth of this digital technology we've had perpetual neo-imperialist war and um, the biggest displacement of populations around the world the destruction of the of the of our <laughs> ecological system mm -hmm. the the theft of resources and 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 really a new wave of colonialism um, and um, even as we've become a more enlightened and, and uh, culturally and socially enlightened uh, world civilization in some ways, um, it is still a completely stratified class system with mm -hmm. the biggest suction of wealth and power from everywhere to a, 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 super, a super minute and very international and uh, uh, elite. Um, we're not just you know, Europeans, Americans and Europeans, part of an international elite. And, um, and that, um, so there's this very, and, and, and also the, you know, the surveillance state now that, mm -hmm. that you know, the, the whatever Stalin would be 
as Stalin and Mao would be blown away by yeah. what we <laughs> do. Love it, Facebook. With what, no, what we do in America, the amount of like of scrutiny, the you know, we blow the you know the KGB and the and the Stasi out of the water as far as like mm. information and surveillance state and stuff like that goes. We have much more sophisticated, and also through our community consumer culture, much more sophisticated, nuanced means of like. Of, of social control than the than the I forget what they call totalitarian or authoritarian states. Mm -hmm. I know, forget which was right and which was left. But anyway, um, um, so so there there is that dark side of of technology and stuff. And I see and I, what I, what I wonder about is I wonder whether the um, whether the popularity of the young generation being so interested in, in, in publishing and stuff like that is, is, has a fad quality or this kind of like, like the LP mm -hmm. thing is a nostalgia for a past mm -hmm. that you never experienced, which is ultimately kind of like a consumer fantasy in a way, and very mm -hmm. much part of, you know, <laughs> capitalist fantasy and mm -hmm. stuff. So, But so. it's also a counterpoint to, to all of that. Uh, if there is so much uh, scrutiny and, and It, you know, making uh, uh, zines in 50 copies and, and sharing them uh, and, and exchanging them directly to people is, is a counterpoint to, yes, exactly. to the old technology uh, daily life that we live. Yeah, and that's and I think that's what's meaningful and substantial about it is that the the kind of the, the analog experience, like the experience of looking at a book is something that's different than looking at your iPhone and that... Um, it isn't like you see in this new generation of publishing is that it's not like a Luddite, you know, rejection or reaction, reactionary movement against technology because the mm -hmm. technology is really being used and deployed in different ways to its mm -hmm. full advantage. But what the technology doesn't offer, what the technology, the virtual community um, is alienating and people realize that. And so they need that physical and real social communities and things and that's where the the publishing and zine is is the process of whether it's you know industrial you know manufacture of of you know large edition offset things or getting that risograph machine and you know pulling together with a bunch of people getting that risograph printer and and learning how to fix it because they break down all the goddamn time but being able to share the resources and then you know, putting out your publication and um, it's a it's all collaborative processes and stuff like that. And then the final sharing of your thing, whether it's through selling or gifting or exchanging and trading and things like that, is there's a community and interactions and things. And I think it's like it's not the same, but it's like the like the the uprising in, in Egypt in Tahrir Square was enabled in a large part by social media and mm -hmm. um, And people took full advantage of the communication that they had through social media, um, but it wouldn't without the physical intervention mm, and the physical the occupation. Meet, uh, and the government yeah. censored the media as mm -hmm. soon as they realized that that was being done. So, and people used media to get around the different forms of, of censorship. But ultimately, there had to be like a physical, you know, um, occupation and intervention. And and. And um, so it's a you know combination of techniques and media and tactics and things mm -hmm. like that. So I think that's interesting. But then ultimately, it's like what is? Then I think in a in a broad picture is that then in a really utilitarian thing. So this this production and um, collaboration and community that's that that I think is attractive to new generations of of literally the first generation that grew up becoming computer literate at the same time that they're learning how to talk. Mm -hmm. um, um, is like, is it sustainable? <laughs> so that's the other aspect mm -hmm. of it. Is it for the most part, it's a gift economy and it's not, it's um, um, people, the publishing, for the most of the, of the independent publishers are subsidized elsewhere. There's some people who figured it out like, Say Red Fox Press, the Irish group, who um, um, uh, the two people I forget, is they hand produce all of their books. They tour book fairs internationally. Um, they have, I think, a mail order business and maybe a retail outlet as well. But it's a total home 
industry mm -hmm. that works. That that mm -hmm. is a lot of work, mm -hmm. but it it it's what sustains these two publishers. Um, but some there's very few examples of that. I think mm -hmm. where it's really top to bottom a self-sustaining thing, and so it's because the books aren't necessary. <laughs> you don't need artist books. <laughs> they're not, yeah. They're, yeah. <laughs> so it's a it's something that someone needs to want to get, and they also need to have the money to get them. Mm -hmm. So whether it's a you know a student who is who is going to be saddled with um, with uh, debt for the next twenty years, but who still knows how to you know play their credit cards against each other and and have some expend you know what do you call it expendable income? Who buys the books? They still are you know college educated and will be part of uh, of that of an, of a middle middle class or more. But to other people, there's there's not. <laughs> Like if you you know like if you can if you can get your information for free through mm. digital communication, why get it in print? And so it is a there is a certain class division between people who are going to get or even consider getting an artist book, and people who who it's just it makes no sense. There's no use. So one of the things that I think is really important for printed matter to do um, is that this notion of distribution, and I think it's very much in line with what the founders, Lucy Lepard and others, had in mind was <coughs> to reach people outside of the art, art audience mm -hmm. and, to, and to work on that. And that was one of the, one of an uh, important point that Lucy made in early, early writings was that it was a way to bring contemporary art to people outside of the urban cultural centers. Mm -hmm. And then she later had to qualify contemporary art because contemporary art was a failure partly because it was not understandable to ordinary people. Mm -hmm. So maybe that is a double kind of a project both to work in is, is making the art more accessible in its content as well as in its, through its distribution systems. Perfect. <laughs>